Good morning. 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 Good Still last night. Okay, so other than other disasters that are going on in the world, uh, today we're going to talk about some problems that we've created for ourselves. So the last week we've talked about concurrency. We've talked about creating the illusion of concurrency inside the operating system. Through the threat abstractions, we've talked about context switches, which are our mechanism for allowing the system to be concurrent by stopping one thread and starting another thread. Unfortunately, this desire for concurrency is going to create some problems for us. We're going to talk about those problems today. Specifically, concurrent execution creates problems in making sure that data stays consistent and creates some challenges in sort of some coordinating, coordinating execution. That's a giant screw. I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> Coordinated execution between multiple threads. Okay, so last thing I'm going to say about the game, other than where this all all of that. Okay, okay. So a couple of announcements. So assignment zero is due today at five. Fung is holding office hours today from noon to two. I will be in my office after class. If you would like to come by, if you need some help with things, but assignment due today at five. I want to get assignment zero in and move on so we can go on to fun stuff. Assignment one will come out as soon as possible, probably today, maybe tomorrow. Might be kind of a multiple phase release. But at this point, a lot of the tools that we need to release the assignments are already built. So hopefully, assignment zero will go a little faster. Okay? Um, we're still working on the recitation times. For now, we're going to stick with the ones that we had already established. Uh, look on the website. Do note that the Location of two of the recitations has changed. So two of the recitations that were in Calvert 111 have been moved to Davis 113, which is a much nicer room in a much nicer building. So hopefully, um, yes. So finally, I, you know, just just in case you didn't realize this, the class when we send email to the class list, other than suggestions for how I need to humiliate myself today after the new English. Football Patriot lost. Um, emails we send to the class list are kind of important. I try to keep them as brief and to the point as possible. So please read them. When you email the staff and you say, hey, I don't know how to do this completely obvious thing that we explained over the class list about five minutes ago, then usually that makes us wonder if you're really paying much attention or reading the class list. So you're responsible for email sent to the class list. There's an archive. I think the link to the archive should be in the emails itself. If it isn't, I'll fix it. And if you need to review things, go in the archive and all the emails we send with it. All right? Any questions about sort of administrative stuff? OK, so let's review. So last week, we talked about, again, about the CPU abstraction, particularly threads. We talked about how to implement them. We talked about the goals, concurrency. Uh, we talked about context switching. Uh, any <coughs> questions about stuff from last week? Any questions, burning doubts, uh, desires to talk about things? Another D word, desires to talk about Any questions? Okay. All right, welcome guys. Come on in. Um, all right, so let's review. Starting in the back. I always get the same people in the back. I'm going to start in the front. So I'm going to start smack in the middle. Operate systems need to from original images to multiplex resources. Good. Processors grant special privileges to the operating system through. Well, the kernel is the operating system, but how do I do that? You're close. Let's see one word. Kernel. No. Kernel mode. Kernel operating mode. When I'm in kernel operating mode, what can I do? I have access to what? I have a different view of memory. OK, that's one thing. What else? I have special instructions that I can execute, and I have a different view of memory. So again, come back to memory about week. OK, interrupts. Three reasons that the operating system would start to execute. What are the things that will cause the operating system to begin to run? Exception, binary, OK, there it is. Ah, man, you took all three answers. Hardware needs attention. Hardware interrupts. 
device requests some services. Software requests some services. <coughs> Software wants to do something that requires the operating system, namely perform a system call. Have the operating system do some work with devices or other pieces of the system that are privileged on the software's behalf. And finally, if the software does something unfortunate, then the software will generate an exception, which the operates the lock can. Yeah? Can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Uh, why why, why there, there is no hardware exception here? So, OK, fair enough. So there could be cases where the, the, you're saying the hardware has some sort of fault or whatever, right? And th those would be handled like probably through the hardware in our method, right? From the perspective of, of the uh, processor, interrupts and other exceptional conditions might look fairly similar. Right? The difference is that there, there, are, there, are, there are instructions that I can execute as an application that will cause an exception. Right? And again, everybody's favorite is divided by zero, but also things that use virtual memory will generate exceptions. It's just a little bit of a different mechanism. I think it's worth separating those two for the purposes of software. But in general, you can think about hardware and even attention. Hopefully, will generate some sort of interrupt because the device just sits there not doing anything. Then it might be very difficult for the kernel to figure out what's wrong with it. So the device is really dead, right? Like if you go and just pull the device out of your system, so it never generates another interrupt, never responds to another command. That's probably not going to put the operating system in a position where it really has very many good options, right? All right. CPU limitations. So the two limitations of the CPU we talked about, the operating system tries to address one of them, right? Here. Here is this, this, this part of the Two problems, two limitations of the CPU that the operating system is going to try to overcome or address. Too fast. Faster than other parts of, this, of the system. What's the other? More fun. There's a lot. Only one processor, or maybe there's four cores now, eight cores. But in general, the number of cores is less than the number of things that the system is trying to do at any given point. Okay. Context switching. What is a context switch? Vinu. Context switching is where the process switch <coughs> mechanism of multiplexing. Okay. And what context switch? I switch between two what? Two processes. Two processes or two threads. Two threads. threads. In this class, we think a little bit more about threads as the CPU abstraction. But there are times in which we will talk about switching between processes if the processes have only one thread or if we're switching between two threads that have to belong to the process. So if I switch between threads and those threads belong to the processes, then I can talk about switching between the processes. All right, private, set, private thread state. Please. I just definitely. Uh, address space. Address space. Register, well, address space is usually shared with other threads, but what part of the address space? <laughs> the stack, right? thread stack. That's where threads store local variables. Right? So a variable in the function context stored on the stack, those variables are private to the thread. Right? Registers and stack. All right, context switching creates the notion of what? What's the illusion that we were trying to create? Concurrency, right? The illusion that one processor is being seamlessly divided between multiple tasks, or sometimes we think of it as each task having its own processor, right? I'm executing instructions, and it looks to me like a sequential scheme of instructions, despite the fact that the processor is, is being stopped and switched over to another thread and then switched back to me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, OK. Thread state. So we talked about this a little bit on Friday. I'd like to kind of slow down, make sure that, that you guys get this across. And maybe I didn't spend enough time here on Friday. So threads, the states that a thread can be in. What is the running state correspond to? All the way over there. Um. It's running. It's, it's executing instructions on a core, right? What about the ready state, Robert? It's ready to run, but it's not started yet. It's ready to run, but it's not running at the moment. So it could be run. It could be scheduled. I could move it onto the CPU and it could just keep on running, right? Waiting, blocked, or sleeping. Anybody? Waiting for a smile. Waiting for something to happen. But and more importantly, it is not ready. It cannot be run. If I started to run this thread, something that it's asked for to happen hasn't happened yet, and it wouldn't, the, the, you know, it, something like, for example, if it made a system call, let's say it made a read system call, the semantics of the read system call are either that it has to fail or I have to copy some data into a buffer that the thread has set up for me. 
So if the call's not done, the data hasn't been copied, and I start running the thread again, then it's going to think there's data there, and it's going to process garbage or some you know, uh, bit of data that's half finished. Right? So it means that something that the thread asked to do hasn't completed yet, or some condition on the system hasn't been met, and to start the thread up again would cause it to be in some sort of bad state or to read. Is something that it's asked for hasn't been finished. Right? Okay. Transitions between thread states. Running to ready. What does this mean? What's that? You weren't there. That's class. Everybody has to know everything in this class. Okay. Um, running to ready, right here. Go down the road. Um, Why does the thread transition from the running state to the ready state? Uh, what I'm looking at talking about. What's that? A context switch, right? And a context switch that, that caused the kernel to, to deschedule this thread or stop it from running, right? So that another thread can run. Listen to me. All right, running to waiting. What, what did the thread do that caused it to leave the running state and enter the waiting state? System call. System call. It made a system call. Right? It asked me to do something. Right? Asked the kernel to do something. I'm the kernel. Whenever I say me, I'm the kernel. Identify with my material. All right. <laughs> Waiting to the ready state. Right? What happens to a thread right here? So, so, um, it had delicious system call. Right? Yeah, something that was happening, waiting for happened. Right? And now the thread is ready to be rerun. Maybe I finished writing the data from the system call the buffer that it established, and now I can start up again at some point. Right? Ready to running. We call that. Yeah, get scheduled. Right? I schedule the thread. I let it run. And then finally, actually, I had all these. Okay. Running to terminate. Running to terminate. What, what happened in this case? Either it has been completed or it has been killed. Right. Something something happened that caused me to terminate. Either it called exit or maybe it did something naughty like divide by sequence. Okay. So any other questions about the stuff that we covered last week? Yeah, Mark. So, so there were some things about the user threads. Um, so you have spoken about the user threads as the Right. So <coughs> I had material on Friday's slides comparing implementations of threads in user and kernel mode. That is that in material is <laughs> um, so that material is in the slides. Um, I'm not going to uh, cover it in class because I, I kind of think we need to keep going. But uh, if so here, here here's the deal I'll make with you guys. If that material, if I decide that I want that material on the exam, I will record maybe a 10 minute video to put it online where I cover those slides in the comfort of my own office. And then you guys can review. Right? That, that stuff may appear on a test because it's a good, it's a good design, there's good design questions there. Right? But I would encourage you to review that material on your own, send questions into the staff list, and again, if I think I need to review it further, I'll just record a little video of right? you. Does that, does that sound fair? Okay. But that's yeah, that's that's a cool topic. I wish I had got there, but I, I don't want to get too bogged down. Okay. Sorry, any other questions? Sorry. Uh, if a process spawns too many threads, uh, does it mean it gets an error priority like in the CPU schedule? Uh, does the CPU has to take scheduler has to take care of number of threads created by a process? So right. So if a process Right. If a process on Linux, for example, creates a bunch of quote unquote lightweight processes or threads, then that does affect how it's scheduled. At the same time, the kernel is also aware of the fact that that process has a lot of threads. So if, if you might think, you know, I can monopolize the CPU, I can get more than my fair share of time on the CPU by creating a bunch of threads, right? And I, I think, I don't know, I don't know exactly how this works out. My guess is that that's true to a certain degree, but at the same time, you're not fooling the kernel, right? The kernel knows what you're trying to do, right? The kernel knows that, hey, this process here has 10 threads, right? This other process here has one thread. And so the kernel can take those differences into account. So if I created a bunch of, like, 1,000 threads, right, I'm not, in general, going to get a 1,000 times more CPU time than I had if I created 
kernel is probably going to share some of the CPU time that would have been allocated to my entire process across that one. And so that creates an, yeah, I mean, we don't want to create an incentive for processes to just spawn threads so that they can affect the schedule. Right. That's a good point. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that, I think, when we get to schedule. All right, any other questions about this stuff? It's a good question. All right, so now let's talk about, the, you know, this problem that we've created for ourselves, right? So we, and, and you know, we've decided, you know, computers got powerful and more people wanted to use them, and so we decided to start implementing this multi-programming abstraction, and we started to do preemptive context switching, right? We started to, to stop threads in the middle of something without asking their permission, without you know, giving them any sort of notice, putting them aside, letting some other thread run, and, and bringing them back up, right? And that illusion is really powerful and useful. Right? We talked about this last week, right? And you know, threading is a, it can be a good mental model to think about how to structure programs. Right? How to structure GUI applications, how to structure anything that has a number of things that are going on at the same time. It can be useful to think about, oh, I'm going to start up a thread to do that task. Right? To, to wait for somebody to click various pieces of the display, to go and fetch a certain part of the web page, whatever. Right? And we also have shown that threading can high latencies caused by slow software devices. So rather than having to stop an entire process, I have one thread in the process that could be blocked waiting on you know, network I.O. or file I.O. or something else, while other threads in the process can continue to be useful work if there's useful work to be done. Right? So this is, this is a good thing in general. Right? The problem is, if we go back to our example about the, the cooks, right, that you know, threading and concurrency, particularly preemptive concurrency, creates these problems, right? which is that you know, data so there's two problems, right? One is coordination. So how do we allow multiple threads to coordinate and communicate effectively? We're going to talk a little bit more about coordination later in the week, right? One of the equally important, if not more important, is this idea of correctness. So we need to establish a way for multiple threads who are accessing shared data to ensure that those accesses are safe and that we can guarantee or at least have mechanisms that allow us to try to guarantee that the result is going to be as expected. <coughs> the other thing that comes in when we start to talk about multi-threading and concurrency is that there are certain calls that have time-based semantics. So if you look, for example, at the, the read system call Linux man page, it states that when a read is performed, if a process can show and I actually don't know what the mechanism for doing this is. But if there was a write that occurred, and I can show that the write occurred before the read, even if the write was done by another process, the read is supposed to return the updated data. So this is an example of time-based semantics for a function call. Right? If a, read, if a write happened before a read, even by any other process on the system to the file, then the read is supposed to be guaranteed to return the data that was written. And enforcing these kind of semantics requires synchronization between them. So again, today we're going to focus on correctness. We're going to start building up in terms of like low-level synchronization principles. And then Wednesday and Friday, we're going to keep talking about higher-level primitives that are built to solve problems. One of the things about synchronization is that the primitives that we talk about in this class and the mechanisms are very much responses to actual problems that system designers face. So we're going to talk about some general purpose primitives. And then there's a whole, if you go look at Linux or Windows, they've got you know, a dozen different synchronization uh, mechanisms that are built around different patterns of data sharing. Right? They're built to support a certain component of the system that shares data in a certain way and make that efficient. Right? We're going to talk about some of the ones that are more generally useful to solve large variety. All right, and then the last thing I want to say, and the thing that you guys are going to experience. So in general, synchronization is a broader topic than just confined operating systems. How many people have ever you know, took a class that's really focused on, on multi-threaded programming using some of these tools? Oh, gosh. OK. Good. Right? I mean, at some level, that's good, because here it is. You're going to learn it. Right? But on the, another level, this is one of those parts of the class that's actually really applicable to everything other than operating systems. Right, it's very likely that you guys will write multi-threaded code in your future programmers, and you will need to use some of these ideas. One of the reasons that we talk about this in operating systems is that operating systems 
in many cases provide help in implementing some of these primitives and guaranteeing their correctness. The other thing that you get to do in this class is you get to you know, work on quote unquote patient zero, right? Which is the operating system itself. So this is, you know, the, the, in many ways, the gnarliest and the, the most difficult uh, multi-threaded application that, that anybody is likely to write. And you know, it's it's why is this, right? Well, it's multiplexing access to resources. Would be the, these are inherently shared. Anything I'm multiplexing is shared, right? I'm using a lot of threads within the operating system itself to hide some of the latencies um, that we've talked about, right? And basically, when I have a lot of shared state and a lot of threads, I create all sorts of interesting synchronization. So the, the primitives that you guys are going to develop for assignment one, you will continue to use them. You will have to use them for assignments two and assignments three. Right? So if assignment one seems a little bit arbitrary in terms of some of the things that you have to do, remember that you need to know how to use these primitives and know how to think about multi-threaded programming in order to do the later assignments. And of course, right, if the operating system goes bad, then that's bad. Right? I mean, if your, if your web server messes up, it's multi-threaded programming, it dies and you restart it. Right? If your OS messes up, then that's, that's a little bit more serious. Right? OK. So concurrency, implementing the illusion of concurrency using the mechanism of a context switch has implications for how you think about sequential execution. OK? And as an application programmer, and even within the kernel, right, right in the kernel, here are the things that you are no longer allowed to assume. Threads, well, here's the things that you have to constantly think about. Threads can be run in any way, right? But you can't make any assumptions about how threads are scheduled. At any point in time, a thread can be stopped for an arbitrarily long period of time and restarted again later. And when that thread is restarted, the state of the world may have changed quite a bit. Now, the thread's context and stack will be the same. But any other sort of shared state global variables can change. Right? And so this is the thing that we keep in mind. And finally, again, I mean, threads can be stopped for arbitrary license. And this is unless you know otherwise, unless you've done something about this by using the synchronization primitive. You have to look at your code line by line and essentially say, if this code stopped right here, and some other code ran and made and, and accessed these data structures, what would potentially happen? And this, this is this sort of incredibly um, defensive way you guys have to start thinking as kernel programmers when you work through the rest of this class. Right? So, something we'll come to later too is that things, you know, there, there, I think people are, are, are tricked into these kind of um, erroneous assumptions by the semantics of language. So, for example, you know, some, some hardware instructions may be atomic. We'll talk about atomic in a second. Lines of C code are never atomic. You can never assume that a line of C code is atomic. You have no idea how that line gets compiled down by and how the and what, what are the assembly instructions that get put out. So people will say, well, you know, I added one to this variable and it's just one line of C code, so I figured that you know there was no way for the thread to be stopped. It's, you know, you look and it turns out it's three assembly instructions. Right? And your code got stopped you know, after the first one before the second two. Right? So, there's, there's, you know, this is, so this is the way to think about things. Right? And, it's, and it, you know, this, this is kind of like, you know, there's certain concepts in computer science that, that kind of really will mess with your mind. Right? So recursion. I remember when I first learned about recursion. Recursion is a difficult concept. Right? It requires a certain amount of you know, new thinking. This is the same thing. Right? And, you know, if, if you're feeling comfortable when you're writing some of the parts of the later assignments, try not to feel that way, right? <laughs> try, try to look at them very, very closely and say, okay, am I making any assumptions that I should be making that are on this line? Okay. Now, again, I just want to point out, in general, these are good things. The reason why we've done this is so that the operating system can make better decisions about how to schedule resources, right? But from the perspective of correctness, these things can be your end. All right, so let's go. Let me introduce an example. This is an example taken directly from the preterm exam. This is an example we'll use throughout the rest of this class. Okay? So consider this. Um, I've got a thousand. So this is the, the bank accounts are kind of like the canonical example when we talk about this kind of 
the transformation. I don't know why. Like, look through slide deck after slide deck. Everyone uses the bank account. Maybe it's because people care about money, right? But anyway, so I decided to connect this with something else you guys care about, which is the grades, right? So this, this gives you some general sense of, of what my sort of, uh, you know, input to output <laughs> ratio is as far as uh, conversion between dollars and grades, right? So I've got $1,000 in my bank account. Two of you guys are depositing money at the same time. Right? One of you guys is depositing $1,000, the other is depositing $2,000. How many thousands of dollars should I have in my bank account when this finishes? $4,000. $4,000, right? Not that much, okay? Is this really cell phone bakery? Turn off our cell phones? All right. I'll just zap people with my laser pointer on it. Okay, so here's my snippet of code, okay? And let's not get into an argument about whether this would compile or whether or not this is a good way to write this function or whatever, right? This is, this is how, you know, some, you know, person at your company who may be your boss wrote this, right? Okay? And this, and what does this code do, right? So, you know, first thing it does is it acquires the balance in my account. It stores that in a local variable. It increments that local variable by the amount that you're depositing. And then it stores that amount back into the account. And then there's this function at the bottom that, that sends me a little text message explaining that there's, you know, that, that there's more money in my account. Okay? So assuming that their two deposits are happening concurrently, and they're running on, you know, in multiple threads on the same machine, okay? What's the best case scenario? What, what's the best case scenario from the perspective of correctness? Well, I want to have 4,000. Yes, that's true, right? But, but what's, what's the way in which this is going to happen that, that in some level won't test any of our assumptions? Carl, you want to measure it Well, okay, specific order, but more specifically, what, 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 what about these two threads? If, if the threads don't what, then, then there, there should be no columns uh, guaranteed. Correct. Right. Anybody? Hearing the sequential execution. Right. So if these threads just execute one after the other, right, this thread runs, and then I deschedule that thread, it's finished, this thread runs, then there's no problem here guaranteeing that my final amount is what I want. Okay, so this is this is the, the best case, right? But again, we've created this concurrency monster, and so at any point in this program, thread, you know, the, the red thread could be stopped and the blue thread can run. Okay, so let's go through a little less good example for me. Okay, so what's what's the slightly less good example? There's there's several there's several ways that this could turn out. Okay. So the less good example is the red thread starts to run, and it stores the balance locally. At this point, bam, context switch. Do you like that? <laughs> Working on that one. This is Jersey. Uh, all right. So now the blue thread runs. Okay. Blue thread pulls the balance locally. Okay. Red thread starts to run again, okay? And the red thread finishes storing the balance into the account, which is now, according to the red thread, $2,000, right? What does the blue thread do? What is, going to, what is the blue thread going to do? Well, it's going to overwrite it with what? $3,000. 3000 Because the, over, the, the blue thread has not seen this update, right? And so the blue thread is just operating on its own local state. It's going to add 2,000, and it's going to store 3,000. Okay? And now, you know, something, there's $1,000 that's just kind of gone, right? Not good. All right? What's the real bad case here? Right? No, no, no. Same, same scenario, two deposits. I can get to 2,000, right? And I can essentially get to 2,000 by just inverting, oh, I can get to 2,000 by just inverting the previous example. So if I just swap the two threads, I would end up with 2,000, right? 
because, let's see here, wait, is that true? Yes, yeah, here we go, right? So this guy gets the balance and it's 1,000, this guy gets it and it's also 1,000, he writes 3,000, so for a brief second of time, I have $3,000, but then this guy runs and overwrites that balance with his local saving amount, which is 2,000, okay? Does anyone have any questions about this, all right? This is important to understand because this is kind of the root of this issue, right? This is the root of the problem. And again, don't, I, I, you know, the, the reason why these, this is usually done using C is because it's easier to understand. But what really happens is that this happens, this interleaving will happen at the assembly level. And so this interleaving can potentially happen in the middle of one of these instructions, right? In the middle of a line of C code. Because a line of C code might actually compile into loading the register, or, you know, loading the value into a register from memory, modifying the register, and writing the register back, right? So a single line of this code might compile down into three assembly instructions, depending on the architecture and what kind of instructions are supported. Is but I brought it this way because it's easier to understand. This is just a sort of race condition, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what is this? This is a race condition. And when we, talk, when we talk about a race condition, we say that the output of a process is unexpectedly dependent on timing or other effects. And the critical thing here is it's unexpectedly dependent. We didn't expect that something about how those threads were scheduled would cause me to have either 4,000, 3,000, or 2,000 dollars after the threads completed exit, right? We didn't expect that. That's not the semantics that we want, okay? There are cases in which, you know, in, in, in certain systems, there can be timing dependent effects and you just don't really care, you know? Maybe, maybe you haven't guaranteed that you're always, so for example, if I check my account balance from my bank, right? My bank usually has this disclaimer that says, you know, this account balance may or may not be up to date. And there might be actually, you know, race conditions going on behind the scenes in terms of that, you know, when I check my balance, depending on when things are finished, it might be different, it might be, you know, it might not show some of the latest things. So there are timing, there can be timing effects that are not race conditions because if the semantics of the operation don't guarantee that I see the latest result, then that's okay, right? So again, the critical thing in here is this is not what we expected to happen. It's not what we wanted to happen. In general, again, you know, banks should observe the, the, the law of conservation model. The law of the conservation. All right. And then I, I want you guys to see, I think it's kind of useful to, to see these things as kind of opposites, right? It, it's kind of, the, these are these, this is this tension that's going on in the operators, right? So concurrency, we implement concurrency by stopping and starting any thread at any time, preemptive context switching. Atomicity is something that we require in order to build synchronization primitives, and that's the illusion that a certain set of executions that actually require multiple instructions happen kind of all at once. They're indivisible, right? Atomicity is a good term, right? It, it, it really describes what's going on. And when we talk about database atomicity, we talk about a transaction either happening or not happening, right? On the operating system level, we say from the perspective of another thread that's accessing the shared state, all those operations happen all at once. And that there's no way for the thread to observe any of the shared state in kind of an intermediate state, right? In, in, a, in an incorrect intermediate position, right? When a set of actions that I want to be atomic that are kind of half done but not fully done, okay? Questions about this, right? I'm seeing, I'm seeing looks that either indicate that you guys are confused, or that this is boring, or I need to speed up, or something, right? What is it? How many people think I should speed up? How many people think I should slow down? Yeah, come on. It's this Goldilocks, right? Like, there's only one other option, right? And I don't believe that all of you think the soup is just right, right? <laughs> so, show up hands again. I'm serious. Like, you know, we can, we can spend as much time as we need to. Speed up. Okay, slow down. Stay steady. Okay. <laughs> wow. I made fantastic soup. <laughs> I should do make it some soup. All right. So again, atomicity requires that I be able to stop and start threads, but 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 it also sorry, atomicity requires that I give threads some control over how this happens, right? So concurrency said threads 
You have no control over how you're executed anymore. No control. I can stop you. I can start you. I don't have to tell you. I don't have to say anything. Synchronization and atomicity requires, I think, a thread some mechanisms for kind of telling me, no, 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 no. You know, don't let that guy run that instruction. Or don't stop me until I get to this certain point. Right. We're going to talk about two ways of doing atomicity in a few minutes. OK. So I think that there's an interesting aside here, which is that so you can see that this kind of this tension that I'm building between speed, which we get by adding concurrency, and safety, which we get by kind of getting rid of concurrency, right? reducing concurrency. And most modern operating systems have always started with speed and tried to get safe. Right? And that's an interesting position, right? because how do you think you find out about safety problems? Like something breaks, right? Like Windows gets a call from some client and says, we're having this really weird problem and we destroyed a lot of data and we're getting sued and we think it's because of a bug in the operating system, right? And sometimes that's the case, okay? So there, there are some new research efforts that are essentially trying to reverse this, right? So what if I could build an operating system that was provably correct, right? Provably safe, and then work on trying to make it faster? Right? So in the first case, programmer effort goes to finding and repairing bugs, and normally that's usually done after the fact. Right? In the second case, I can guarantee that my kernel has a certain set of properties, and then I try to work on making it more efficient, right? while not violating those. So there's a paper a couple years ago where they were actually, they had a formal correctness proof of a, a very small operating system kernel. Right? And this took like 12 people five years or something. This is like a massive, massive, massive effort. Right? But they did it, and it's kind of cool. All right. So, so the, one of the, the abstractions to be used to, to think about this is what's called a critical section. Right? A critical section is an area of code. Sometimes we think about it as one function. Sometimes it can span multiple functions or part of functions that looks atomic with respect to other threads executing inside that section. And the way we usually talk about this is there is only one thread, quote unquote, inside the critical section at one time. This is called mutual exclusion. It's the kind of mechanism for it. And, and the, the, the guarantee, if we can provide this guarantee, then it allows us to make changes to state that require multiple instructions without worrying about the fact that anybody might observe the state kind of the, at the wrong time. Right? Because the, we have mechanisms to guarantee that this will all look like one operation. Okay. So, first, okay, so let's go back to our example, right? What is the local, so first question, what's the local state that's private to each thread? Right? Who, who can identify that? GW has, right? This, this variable right here. This is a local variable, it's been declared locally. So where does this variable live? Maybe in a register, but in general, thread stack, right? It's that one piece of private data other than registers that threads have. Right? Okay, what's the shared state that I'm accessing here? What's what's the what's the problem? Why why is there a you know what what's what's the, the poor coordination where it's it's focused on what? Balance. Well, okay, get balance and put balance are functions, but what are they accessing? <laughs> the account, right? So that's the shared state. You know this 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 account key option. Where's my dog? Do you use that? Okay, good. Okay, now, here's the big question. I just told you what the critical section is. But let's, who can identify the critical section? One, two, and three. One, three. One and three. Any other answer? One, two, and three. One, two, and three. Right? This, this section of code, right? Why is this section in the critical section in this particular example? Because it deals with the account. Because it, it, it's, it's, it's modifying the account, right? These are three instructions that from the perspective of another thread have to look like they all happen at once. I pull the balance, I modify it, and I write a chain. And to another thread, that has to happen all at once, right? Because the problem before was that threads were, you know, basically were able to interleave these executions in a way that didn't produce the correct result. Right? A thread, so essentially what, what happened before is that the other thread would start running right here, right? 
and it would see the account balance in this intermediate state. Because once I start this instruction, the next time that another thread can see the account is only once I've finished doing the deposit. Right? That's the next time that another thread can see the account. If this is going to be correct. Okay. Questions about so the connection between the critical section and this? Yeah. Yeah. What's the? Uh, is there a quick or cute for us to tell what section is critical? Like what determines it? Um, I mean, it, it, so, so, so in general, critical sections. I mean, w w one of the one of the part requirements is they have to modify shared state. Right. Um, that's that's not the only requirement, but that's that's the hard requirement. In terms of this, it's a great question. I, I bet, and I don't know the answer to this, but I bet there are software tools that are built to help identify these sorts of shared variables, right, and figure out what the semantics are. But in general, this comes down to programmer, programmer not, right. I mean, when you write this code, you have to think what happens if the code stops right here and another another piece of code runs. Now, for this example, I don't want to give you the, the illusion that this is this easy. For this example, the only universe of code I've given you is this function, right? In general, there might be other functions. There might be, you know, take guasmula, right? If you, actually, another bit of context for this example. Gua is one of, is, is a nickname of mine. It doesn't really make any sense anymore, but if you want to know why it used to make sense, well, it's a So anyway. Um, so this is me, if, if you guys didn't get that. Um, so there could be, you know, take Wasmula that also accesses the account. And in that case, that area would also have to be, we'd also have to make sure that that area is in a critical section. So, so in general, it's, it's hard to say, right? I mean, sometimes you have a critical section that's all organized around access to one shared state, right? And then sometimes you have other critical sections that, you know, for example, you can think, you can imagine an operating system is frequently have really large uh, pieces of shared state. If every time a thread needed to access any part of it, they had to, you know, prevent threads from accessing all the other parts, there could be a big problem with performance. Right? So sometimes we try to reduce the granularity of the sharing that goes up through through implementing different semantics. Okay. So requirements for critical sections, right? Most fundamental is mutual inclusion, mutual sorry, mutual exclusion, right? <laughs> No other thread should be in the critical state. I have to guarantee this. I, have, I need a mechanism to guarantee this, right? Second requirement is progress. Threads that want to enter the critical state, the critical section, should be able to eventually. If a, if a thread you know, needs to start executing instructions that are in the critical section, and I force it to wait forever, this is not good, right? Because generally, it's trying to do something useful, right? I don't want one of those balances to just stop forever. Right. I want that money. Yeah. All right, and then performance, right? So in general, and again, this is this tension, right? In general, we want to keep critical sections small because they limit concurrency, right? Critical sections prevent other threads from executing bodies of code. If that body of code is, is, is so large that there are large portions of it that that thread could have executed safely, then all I'm doing is I'm taking you know, a multi-core machine or a multi-processor machine, and I'm essentially reducing it into this machine that, 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 is, 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 that is much less parallel than I would need. Right? So, so again, the most broken way of doing this would be to say, the entire kernel is a critical section. Right? As soon as I enter a system call, no other threads can run inside the kernel until that call finishes. Right? But then you know, I'm sitting there waiting for disk I.O. to finish. Right? It's terrible. No one else can run. So, so again, I mean, there, there, is, there are solutions to this problem. So for assignment three, people have, you know, and it's not a terrible solution. Sometimes we tell people to use it, but there's one way of solving uh, the assignment that essentially just has a huge lock around the entire VM system. And it says, you know, if the one thread's executed, we just stop everybody else. Right? Doesn't always, actually, people manage to mess that up too, but that, that, that's not necessarily a great app. It really limits the form. Uh-oh. Uh Firefox update. Let's start now. Okay. So there's two approaches to implementing, there's two mechanisms for implementing a critical section. Right? I'll talk about these quickly right now. So one mechanism is when a thread is inside the critical section, allow that thread to not stop. Okay? So don't interrupt that thread, don't deschedule that thread until it exits. Okay? The other approach is, is these are this is my terminology, is I call it don't enter which means that when a thread is inside the critical section, use some way to keep other threads from entering that critical section. Okay. So based on what we've talked about, 
how do I implement don't stop? It's actually up on the slide. Right? Ah, uh, here we go. Someone's been reading the source code. Okay. So, on a uniprocessor system, right, and again, this is kind of only of historical interest because on multi cores, these things just don't work. Okay? But on a single processor system, when there is only one thread running at a time, if I can prevent that thread from stopping, by definition, no other thread can be in the critical section. Right? So when I'm in the critical section, I just don't stop executing the instruction. If I do that, then I'm OK. Right? The only reason for that is that there's only one thread of execution running on the entire system. So on multi-cores, this doesn't work. Right? The way I do this is I do this by disabling interrupts or masking interrupts. And that means that the hardware interrupts that would normally cause the uh, system to schedule a new thread are not processed. And they're not processed until I leave the critical section and allow the system to start scheduling another thread. Right? Again, this design pattern, historical interest. The other thing that people would frequently do, right? the other reason why this doesn't work in many cases, is remember, I can't stop. Right? inside the critical section. I can't do anything that would stop. One way I would stop is a timer would fire and the kernel would, would stop. But the other way I might stop is I might do something that causes the kernel to stop me itself. So I might do disk IO, right? And I might voluntarily stop exiting. So and, you know, back when OS 161 was a single processor system, we would have cases where people would think that they were, they were implementing a critical section by disabling interrupts, but they would call a function that did IO. And that function would actually cause some other uh, thread to be scheduled, right? And so they, they didn't get the kind of uh, critical section that they were looking for simply because they, they weren't stopped preemptively. They asked to be stopped. Right? They called a function to ask the kernel, I'm stopping because there's something I asked you to do that's going to take a little bit of time. OK, so more generally, we need a way to force other threads to stop, OK? And, and I, so we'll review this at the beginning of class next time, but let me, let me try to get through an example. Okay. The way we do this is we ask hardware for help. And hardware frequently provides one of two different atomic instructions. Now, in, in the interest of making sure that I don't confuse anybody, these are C implementations of these instructions. But this is not how you would implement them in hardware. This is just to show you what would happen programmatically. But what hardware does, so let's look at a test and set, right? So a test and set says, I pass you a memory location and a value. And I want you to write the memory location, but return the value that was there before you wrote what I asked you to write. Okay? And the system will guarantee that this happens atomically. So if two testing sets happen in an interleaved way, and then they're, they're trying to set the variable to different things, the processor guarantees that the first one will execute completely before the second one. So questions about test and sets, right? Again, normally implemented like this, this is not atomic, right? Not atomic in any way. But what happens is that the CPU provides an instruction, a test and set instruction, that guarantees this atomicity through various tricks in hardware by locking buses and doing all sorts of funny stuff, right? One of the things about these instructions on hardware is they tend to be fairly inefficient because, again, at the hardware level, they're destroying the kernel. At the software level, they may look okay, but at the hardware level, they're actually destroying some of the hardware currency that happens behind the scenes. That generally, it's a program where you don't even fit. Okay, I'm not going to talk about compare and swap because I want to get through this, right? But most processors provide either a test and set or compare and swap. On other processors, including the MIPS that you guys are going to use, you can see that David has implemented a test and set for you in C using two MIPS instructions that themselves have atomicity guarantees. So I encourage you to go look at that. I could point out, maybe for assignment one. I think in assignment one, we might point out where that code is. And I would encourage you to go look at it. OK, so let's, mod let's try to finish this example using a test and set. OK? So what, am I, what do I need to do? Right? I have this critical section, which is lines one through three. Right? It's these lines. So what do I need to do? Remember, I need to stop threads that are starting. OK, so, so let's try this example. Right? So I create a shared variable that I'm going to use my test and set to change. Okay? And then what I do is, when I start the critical section, I set the test and set to 1, right? And then when I finish my critical section, I set it to 0. So I'm using the test and set to tell other threads, hey, I'm inside the critical section. 
Does this work? No. Why not? Because you're not checking the value, right? I mean, this is just this 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 just continues, right? So so what do I need to do here? I need to check the value, right? Okay. So how do I yeah, how do I tell if another thread is already set up? So I have to use the return from test and set, right? Remember, test and set returns the old value. Okay. So now here I'm going to test the value of the test and set, right? If it's one, it means that there's already another thread inside the critical section. Then what do I do? Well, I, okay, I don't have any way of sleeping. Have I told you anything about sleep? Well, I mean, that's a good answer. Okay, we'll come back to that one. But for this example, there's no sleeping, right? What do I do? I just check it again. So this is a valid way of doing this, okay? This will actually work. Of course, as you guys probably are starting to think, there's terrible problems with this, right? So what are the problems with this? All right, I'm going to check this over and over again. So does anyone, everyone see how this works? Okay? When a thread is inside the critical section, the test and set will return one, and I will continue to wait in this loop. As soon as the thread exits, it will set it to zero. Only because test and set is guaranteed to be atomic, one thread that is waiting will get the return value of zero and proceed. And it will set it to one, and it will proceed. The other ones will just keep getting one. Right? So again, the hardware guarantees that one thread will be able to set this to one and it will turn zero. Yeah. So is this like zero or one value we're, we're setting just a special register? It's a, it's a, it's a shared thing. It's right up here. Okay. So this is some memory location, right, that the test okay. and set is operating. Yeah. And then the set and test just ensures that that entire thing gets done. Atomic, right? Yeah. So what I don't want to happen is I don't want this guy to set it to zero and then two threads to get the return value zero because they'll both think I can go in, right? So the hardware guarantees that only, no matter how many threads are executing this search function over and over and over again, what, even on multiple ports, right? The same time, not even this full concurrency that I created using context switching, at the same time, right? One of them will get zero and the rest will get zero. Right? So every time I set this to zero, the top will return one once. Sorry. Uh, we'll return zero once. Okay? And then it will for, for one thread once. Okay? And how does it decide which one? Don't worry about it. The scheduling, yeah. The scheduling, yeah. Just, we'll just pretend that hardware does that properly. But, but hardware tests and sets are required to implement some of the features we talked about with critical sections before, including fairness and progress and so on. So if there was one thread on one core that would never, was never able to set the test and set, that would be good. Okay? So again, we're, we're, we're going to go back to this on Wednesday. But, but the problem with this, as you guys can probably see, let me show you how this looks. Right? So here's what happens, right? The red thread starts to run. It's the first thread in. It sets the test and set and breaks out of the loop. Right? Test and set returns zero. What does the blue thread do? Let's say that let's say I'm on the process system and the blue thread starts to run. I just showed you. It just keeps checking this stupid test and set over and over and over and over and over and over, and over until what? It gets descheduled and the red thread can run and clear the test and set, at which point the blue thread can make progress. So on a, on a unit processor system, these, these primitives, if they're not used carefully, can be terrible, right? Because what's happening here? The blue thread is not only not performing any useful work, it's preventing the red thread from performing useful work, right? Because this guy's just going to spin until his time pointer runs out, at which point the red thread runs, OK? All right, so again, we'll, we will come back next time to here. All right, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. And I'm going to take this off.